brace yourself because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechatsplus.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chat. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the list of mysteries in this world is long and flowing. In fact, nearly every chapter of the human story has pages ripped out, redacted, or never written at all. Yet we do see the rubble and remnants of times before that make us curious as to what the past was really like. Pyramids, mounds, megalithic ritual centers, celestial markers, and more. These things should make anyone wonder what the people of the past really knew or thought about this human terrarium and their place within it, because today it's hard to even get that question asked. Now we suffer from a blended cocktail of ignorance, apathy, and dare I say suppression that does not go down all that smoothly for the inquiring minds that actually want to know, and for those folks, we're lucky to have today's guest, Greg Little. For the unfamiliar, Mr. Little is a psychologist by trade who holds a master's degree in psychology as well as a doctorate in counseling from Memphis State University. He is associate editor of Alternate Perceptions and has written over 30 books on a number of subjects from self-help and criminal justice to ancient mound builder cultures, Atlantis, and UFOs. Today we're going to talk primarily about his latest release with co-author Andrew Collins entitled Denisovan Origins, Hybrid Humans, Gobekli Tepe, and the Genesis of the Giants of Ancient America, and I'm sure it's going to be a good time. So here he is, the multidisciplined Denisovan detective, Greg L. Little. Welcome to the higher side. Hi, Greg. Hey, thank you. And that is quite a introduction there. A lot of a lot of uh, very flowing language in the beginning. That was that was impressive. Hey man, I try, I try. You know, just do you do that on every show? Yeah, I would say so. You got to get people warmed up. You know, every subject can be very diverse, and uh, you really got to set them up well. I think because you know attention spans are short these days. Well, you did a great job there. <laughs> My bio's a bit out of date. It always is. I don't even. I don't generally supply a new bio to people as I move along. You just reach a certain age and you go, "Oh, what the heck? You don't care anymore." <laughs> so yes. that's kind of where I'm at with this. I'm just doing what I want to do at this point in life. Right. Hey, amen. Just a couple of Gregs doing what we like to do. That's right. And, Pair of Gregs. <laughs> yes, and I'm really looking forward to this, man, because you've written plenty of books that fit squarely in our wheelhouse, and I hope we have time to touch on several of them. But it is Denisovan Origins, which is also in part connected to your other book, Path of Souls, that are the main offerings on the table today. And I really enjoyed the book. I think the mound building cultures of ancient America and the idea of giants are both pretty exciting and interesting. And as someone who's also fascinated by synchronicity and dreams, I think a good place to start is to ask you how you even got interested in mounds, because it seems like something you couldn't ignore, right? Wow, I'm surprised you brought that up. I'm not sure what where you read that or which book it was in. I know it wasn't it wasn't in Denise of an Origins, was it? No, it was not. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. Well, back in nineteen eighty four I had my first book published. And that's a long time ago, before a lot of your listeners were born. And that book was called The Archetype Experience and it tried to explain the UFO phenomenon through Carl Jung's idea of synchronicity. In any event, 
I did that the old-fashioned way, and that is you, you type out a manuscript, you make multiple copies, and you send them off to publishers, and you wait. And I got many rejections. I got some interesting rejections from some publishers, but eventually I found a small publisher that put it out. But during that roughly year's time where I had to wait for this first book to come out, something happened to me, and that is this. I had a intrusive dream that occurred roughly 10 nights in a row. The dream seemed to come out of nowhere, and on the dream, or in the dream, I was standing on an Indian mound, and I took some pictures, and then suddenly I was standing on another Indian mound, and I took pictures, and on another and took pictures, and another, and this went on. This was the dream. It was a recurring dream that went on night after night after night. Now, I say this all the time, but it's totally accurate. What I knew about Indian mounds at the time could have fit on the back of a postage stamp. Now, I know most of your readers will not be familiar with what a postage stamp is, right? <laughs> <laughs> a postage stamp is a little tiny piece of paper you put on an envelope and mail it off. So it's not very big. And that was an old joke that was used back a long time ago. But I really knew nothing about mounds. I knew next to nothing about Native Americans. Nothing was taught in my high school history classes. Nothing was taught in college about it. I took anthropology and archaeology as courses, never heard a bit about them. So my wife and I decided, because of this dream, I had no idea where it was coming from. We went to a mound. I live in Memphis, Tennessee. We went to a mound here I'd never been to. And when we walked in, we saw something. It was actually a spider illustration. And I just knew instantly that I had to visit all of the known mounds in the in America that I mean North America when I say that get a photographic record of them and generate a pictorial illustrated encyclopedia now this came again out of nowhere and that started a quest to go to Native American mounds which we did we wound up going to thousands and thousands of them took so many pictures, and back in those days, you had to print them out, and I wasn't entirely organized because I was doing a lot of other things and work, so I didn't even write the, the name on a lot of them, but I did finally finish that Mound Encyclopedia book. The first edition came out in 2009. It took that long, and I updated it in 2014, I believe, and I believe it was 16, and that's available and out, and it has about 3,000 mounds in it in North America. But that's how that started. It came out of nowhere from a dream. <laughs> and I know it's an unusual story, but it's absolutely the truth. I have no explanation for it, except I, when I came out with the 1990 book, which was a follow-up to that first one that was about Carl Jung and UFOs, I started talking about Native Americans in it. And then I had an aunt and an uncle and my father who said, oh, by the way, your great-great-grandmother was Native American. She was Seneca. And I had no idea. And then that actually made me look at it into all of it even deeper. Wow. So that's kind of the story. That's how I got into it. I love it. Answering the call of the mounds and maybe even your own ancestors. <laughs> well, maybe. I will. I'll add one more piece to this. When I was doing the book, that encyclopedia. It is so detailed and it's got so much information packed into it. It's an oversized hardcover that's the size of an encyclopedia volume. And I got about two thirds of the way through it and I just went, oh my God, this is too much work. I have other things I have to do. And nobody's going to read this thing anyway. It's not going to sell. I'm doing all this work for nothing. And I decided I'm just not going to do it. And that night, starting that night, I had dreams and I had these Native Americans, shaman, loads of others coming and screaming at me, saying, you said you were going to do this. You promised us you were going to do this. We're going to bother you till you get this done. And I mean, they screamed and screamed. And then this, this happened for about two nights. The second night I knew, okay, I got to do this. So I just recommitted myself to doing it and the dream stopped. And I haven't had a single one since because I did go ahead and complete it and get it out. And that ended it. Just very strange, but true. And for a psychologist, it's not unusual to say this kind of stuff. 
but usually you're saying it about other people, not yourself. <laughs> well, you know, I guess dead men can tell no tales, but they can harass you in your dreams. It, it appears it appears so. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's the story, and that's been written up several places. I've said it quite a few times, and it's just the way it was. I don't really know what to say other, about it other than that. It's just the way it was. Yeah, life is weird, and I'm sure that is just a detail that is interesting for an audience like this. And another little detail I heard that is kind of in the realms of uh, getting intimate with indigenous spirituality, maybe even that has an emphasis on entheogenic experiences, but you had a Native American shaman and his family move in with you for a month. Is, is that true? Oh my, you have done your homework. I dig, man, I dig. You, you've done your homework on that. Yes, I do, I do not recommend that to anyone. It wasn't just the shaman, it was in his entire family. That occurred in 1989. It had to do with, I was working for government at the time, and I got involved in a standoff between a group of very angry Native Americans and a group of archaeologists who were trying to do an excavation into a mound in downtown Memphis. And one thing led to another, and finally this shaman, he was an arrow priest of the Cheyenne, he, his wife, and his three kids moved into our house, stayed with us exactly 30 days. They left the day the Memphis City Council passed a resolution that barred the archaeologists from digging into these mounds. During those 30 days, he and I had a lot of talks. He actually had the seven sacred arrows from the Cheyenne tribe that go back a couple thousand years at least, and they were used in their ceremonies, and he had those wrapped up with him. Long involved story, but I learned quite a bit. It also, he would bring, when we'd talk about sacred things, he would bring in dirt from the outside, and he would toss it on himself and say, oh, this, this is sacred knowledge, I have to purify myself. And now the, the whole idea of dirt being used to purify yourself is that they believed everything had a spiritual nature and everything had spirit within it. The most primordial spirit of all is soil or dirt. Rocks represent a form of condensed spirit. Crystals are the most pure of spirit energy. Water is flowing spirit and so on. But they believe everything has a spiritual nature. Archaeologists and anthropologists used to deride that as animism. That is, that they believe everything is alive. But it's not really, they didn't really mean this idea of spirit and everything in that it's alive. But it has a form of consciousness that where everything is one and it's all part of the whole and everything has a spiritual nature. So, yeah, we had weird experiences with him. We went outside several nights, and he pointed to different areas of the sky and said, this means this, and this means that, that various constellations. They did not use the same names for stars and constellations that we use today, but almost every tribe has its own names and terms for various constellations. Hmm. I am surprised you dug that story out. Ah, uh, it's not that hard. Yeah, you've done some research here. <laughs> it's the one job that a host should have. But hey, so that is some, those are some great anecdotes to get us started here. But when it comes to this book, Denisovan Origins, it's really two full books in one. But the first part, Old World Cosmogenesis, is written by Andrew Collins. And the second part, American Genesis, is written by you. Obviously, Andrew isn't here, but could you give the people a bit of an overview of Andrew's contribution before the story gets to America where you pick it up? Well, Andrew Collins is is very well known. He's almost he's on almost every episode of the show Ancient Aliens. He's on several other series, network series pretty often. He's best known for his work in about Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. He's well known for European archaeology, and of course, a lot more is known about European archaeology and history than the Americas. History here started for us 1492. That's why we call it the historic period. Hmm. Everything before that's prehistory. But in Europe, there are records that go way back, so there's a lot more known. So Andrew 
has done a lot of work in Egypt. He actually discovered a cave system under the Giza Plateau, and the Egyptians even named it after him. It's known as Collins Caves. Andrew is famous for really challenging what is called the OCT, the O-C-T, the Orion Correlation Theory, which, which theorized that the three the three main pyramids at the Giza Plateau in Egypt are aligned to the constellation of Orion. So Andrew and some colleagues, some professional colleagues of his found that the three main pyramids at Giza are also aligned exactly to the three crossbar stars of the constellation of Cygnus, which is known as the Northern Cross. So that is that is what Andrew is known for, but he's written a lot about this site in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe. And Gobekli Tepe is the oldest stone temple known in the world, dates to roughly 10,000 B.C. Actually, it's more like 9,600 B.C. or so. It's a massive site in southeastern Turkey. Uh, it has these huge pillars of stone that are like 16 feet tall. Some of them are 20 feet tall. Just monstrously huge T-shaped pillars that probably held a roof up, but they have these incredible intricate carvings of animals and, and human forms on them. And it it changed everything. The discovery of Gobekli Tepe around 2000, the year 2000 or so, changed everything. And when I mean it changed everything, up until that time, and really, we're talking around 2010 when everybody knew that, okay, this is dated that old. Up until that time, everyone in archaeology thought that civilization began roughly 4,000 B.C., that that began the earliest stone carving, stone structures, and megalithic buildings, that there was nothing before that. Everyone was a hunter-gatherer before that. But now we know that's not true. So that pushed the dates back for everything. And, of course, oddly, Gobekli Tepe's burial, which occurred around 9600 B.C., occurred right at the same time that Plato's Atlantis supposedly was destroyed and disappeared. And that, of course, has driven archaeologists, mainstream archaeologists, nuts because they hate the, the whole idea of Atlantis. But Andrew wrote in the beginning of this book that this these people – People known as the Denisovans, you can call them Denisovans. Most of it, most uh, Andrew says that over there they pronounce it Denisovan, but it, to me it doesn't matter. They're actually named after the cave in which their remains were very first discovered, and a monk by the name of Denis lived in this cave, so they called it the Cave of Denis. Therefore, they became known as the Denisovans. The cave was located in the Altai Mountains of Siberia. It's in Russia. Initially, when they went into the cave, they found habitation layers of modern humans. They dug lower. They found habitation layers of Neanderthals, and they dug lower. And then they discovered this unknown, much, much deeper layer that had initially a finger bone and a couple other little pieces of bone. And now they know they've they've recovered now a jaw of a Denisovan in China. They have found pieces elsewhere, and they have a lot more bones. But the interesting thing is they did a full genetic sequence of this finger bone, which was in incredible. And that genetic sequence showed it was an entirely different species of humans. They have now taken them back to seven hundred thousand years ago, which is astonishing. So they're, they were contemporary with the Neanderthals, but they are different. But they did interbreed with the Neanderthals. And this is all, I'm not talking woo-woo here. This is mainstream archaeology, mainstream genetics. The Denisovans and the Neanderthals interbred among themselves, and they interbred with modern humans later. Now, modern humans supposedly developed around 200,000 years ago or so. but all these species interbred, but the Denisovans died out, as did the Neanderthals. It's unclear why. They may have been killed off, but no one really knows. But what was discovered with them, and even more recently with Neanderthals, is that these were not stupid brutes who walked hunched over and who were more ape-like than human. 
these were very intelligent creatures who made drawings, who made paintings, who actually made clothing, which they sometimes sewed. These were people who made beautiful jewelry. Andrew loves to talk about the discovery of a hole in some of their polished Moldavite jewelry that the scientists have said that it could only have been made by a high-speed drill. Now, as soon as I use that term, everybody thinks of electricity, but we're not talking about electricity. There's a lot of ways you can make a high-speed drill that makes a really smooth, polished interior. But they actually had a lot more capability than we would believe. So these people were the beginning of really modern knowledge. They started the, they started the first art. As they developed, they passed along some of their information to the modern humans. So basically I'm following Andrew's chronology now. And then these groups slowly moved toward the West. So they were in Asia. They started moving toward the West and their cultures developed through a long series. One of them was called the Swiderians and I'm not, that's Andrew's forte, but eventually they got to the far western coast of Europe, which would be France and Spain and Portugal, and they became known as the Salutrians. This is about 20,000 years ago. The Salutrians made a very distinctive type of spear point, a very large spear point that had fluted size. A flute is really a channel that makes the spear point thinner, but it makes it easier to use and it makes it much more lethal. And what you have to remember is that that time frame, 20,000 years ago, virtually all of the continents in the world were overrun by these gigantic creatures such as woolly mammoths and mastodons, tree sloth, saber-toothed tigers, and so on. So the humans who were around at that time had to have a way to protect themselves. So they developed these spear points. Now, sometime Around 15,000 years ago, the Salutrian culture disappeared. And when I say it disappeared, it simply means their points are no longer found. They evolved into someone else. And the thing is, they didn't need the points anymore because all of these, all of the large creatures there had been killed off. But it appears that they then went around the area of Iceland and Greenland, just like the Norse supposedly did in around the year 1000. And they wound up in Canada, and they began spreading out across North America, and they became what is known as the Clovis culture, which for a long time was the initial culture believed to be the first inhabitants of the Americas. And we know that now is not true, and archaeology knows it's not true. But the Clovis culture did start apparently in the East Coast, and it spread to the West. It never got too far south. It never went further south than Panama. And the Clovis culture appears to have merged with people who were already here. Now we're getting to my my part of the book. And they were here as long ago as 300,000 years ago. They came multiple ways from many places. And it all, the Clovis culture suddenly disappeared and it all collapsed around 9600 BC with a catastrophe we call today the Younger Dryas event, which was a cooling of the earth. So that really gets you up to where my part of the book really begins. But I can't do justice to Andrew's part. It's just Andrew is an, is an incredibly intricate and detailed writer. And how he does that it, to make it explainable and understandable to people is kind of beyond me. <laughs> I try to write in a much simpler fashion. And I'm willing to gloss over a lot of details just because I don't want to get bogged down in it. <laughs> I understand. These things are very complex, and that was a great summary of a couple hundred thousand years in just a few minutes. So, Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that brings us up to speed. Basically, now we know the whole human story. And, uh, That's the now, end of the show, right? Yes. <laughs> Actually, that, that, that next 10 to 15,000 years is the most interesting to me anyway. It is. And of course, the closer the proximity is to it, the more details you can actually uncover. And when it comes to the mounds and the excavations and the giant skeletons, you know, that first round of really learning about these things for Westerners, a lot of this started with Thomas Jefferson, right? He had a preoccupation with these mounds. Well, yes, that's actually true. Jefferson played quite a role in all this. 
Jefferson supposedly did the first excavation into any mounds, and he did it on his own land. And it was pretty impressive. But he did not find what I would call giants in there. He just found normal-sized humans. But Jefferson actually set out several people on expeditions to map and survey a number of mounds. But it was really the Smithsonian, and and at the very beginning of the Smithsonian, starting around 1882 or so, where the real work on North American Indian mounds began. The Smithsonian had a project forced upon them by the U.S. Congress, and it lasted from 1882 to 1891, so it ran nine years. During that time, the Smithsonian field agents dug into 2,000 mounds, and they collected 40,000 specimens, which were mainly skulls. They wanted skulls for display and artifacts. They wanted to fill the new Smithsonian Museum in Washington with these beautiful artifacts that they could pull out of mounds. During those excavations, the Smithsonian pulled out of these mounds 17 large skeletons ranging in height. A few of the 17, three of them were under 7 feet, but they were all way over 6'5". There were 14 of them that were 7 to 8 feet in height, which is astonishing when you realize how few skeletal remains they actually did pull out of the mounds. Most of these were found in very elaborate tombs. There is an area of the United States along the Kanoa River Valley, which runs into the Ohio, but it it goes through West Virginia. And on both sides of the Kanoa River, particularly near Charleston, South Charleston, West Virginia, there were seven of these seven-footers pulled out in a series of mounds. And they were in really very elaborate tombs with a lot of artifacts, We know the era that these people were buried, roughly 1000 B.C., 1500 B.C., and it's called Adena, A-D-E-N-A, era mounds, which the Adena ran from about 2000 B.C. to roughly 500 B.C. There are loads of Adena mounds. They're giant conical mounds. When I say conical, I mean it's like uh, like the top of an ice cream cone. That's literally where the word comes from. So they're cone-shaped mounds. They can get enormous. The tallest ones have been some 80 feet. Today, the tallest one, I believe, is 72 feet high that remains. But they're huge. They're gigantic. And usually in the base, right in the middle, at the bottom, there is a really elaborate tomb. Now, there are burials generally above that tomb that are less elaborate because they do the initial burial and then they do more and more on top of it. So the mound would get bigger and bigger. But that's just one kind of mound. So that really is the, that, that idea that the Smithsonian found these seven foot to eight foot tall skeletons is really the beginning of it. Modern archaeologists deny every one of those, even though they're in the Smithsonian publications. And at the same time, they're not the only ones found, even after the Smithsonian did its excavations. Modern archaeologists have found many more seven to eight foot tall skeletons as they did more and more excavations. But excavations into mounds, burial mounds, essentially stopped in 1990 because of a law. So there hasn't been anything else done. And all of these large skeletons that were pulled out of mounds are gone. And what happened was in 1989 and 90, Two laws were passed. One law specifically applied to the Smithsonian, and the other one applied to every other place that ever received a penny of federal money, or ever would receive a penny of federal money, that they had to repatriate, which means give back any skeletal remains and any burial artifacts to the native, any Native American tribes that would claim them. And if they could not find anybody to claim them, then they had to keep them in storage and not let anyone look at them or examine them at all for any purpose. So today, it's like the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian has less than 300 of these remaining. And all of the ones that they have remaining out of probably millions of artifacts they've accumulated from the 1800s, they've given it all back but 300. And the 300 they have 
all come from South America. They can't get any South American tribes to take them back. So that's where we're at. No one can really examine any of these, even if you could find one. It's not legal to do the testing. The last one that I'd ever heard of where the testing was done was the famous Kennewick Man. Kennewick Man was found in the along the uh, a river in Washington State. Can't remember the name of it now. But when it was found, it was just found washed up in this river. It was tested. It was found to be 9,000 years old. Native Americans wanted it, but the scientists and archaeologists wanted to test it. So it was kept in storage. And that one skeleton, the legal proceedings, went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court in order for it to have any genetic testing done on it. So they finally, and I think it was an eight-year run before it was done, they did the genetic testing on it, and then it was given to the Native Americans. So that it takes it's that hard to do any kind of testing on remains. The, these giants did exist. There is a tremendous amount of evidence even beyond this in both North and South America that there was some hereditary branch of individuals who were the elite leaders of the population who passed along their knowledge hereditarily, that is, from one parent to the to the children, and they would become the shaman, the medicine men, and perhaps even the rulers of the society. And they probably interbred among themselves in a very small closed group. This definitely went on in South America, which we know through all of the research on skeletons there, because the laws in North America don't apply to South America. So we know that, that it was hereditary, at least there. And of course, you have three dramatically different types of cultures between South America, the Central American cultures with their pyramids, and then North American mounds. Pyramids were not built in North America. They built, they built incredible mounds and earthworks, geometric earthworks, which are amazing. It is hard to describe the amazing thousands of geometric earthworks that were made in North America. And most people that hear an explanation or see a map or pictures of them or a survey, when they go to it and they look at it, they go, oh my God, I had no idea. So you hmm. really can't describe in accurate terms what these geometric earthworks were. Just like it's hard to tell people about all the pyramids in Central America built by the Maya and the Aztecs and the the mixed texts and so on. You have to go see them. And then South America has these giant megalithic stone structures. So we have three very distinct cultures in the Americas. But the giants were also in South America. People like Magellan, Lord Byron, many other really famous, famous people saw these giants in South America. Francis Drake was one. Drake actually measured some of them, physically measured them. And they found the ones in South America. There were some initially that they said were 10 feet and every time, 10 feet in height. Every time they came back, every time the early explorers came back to South America, we're talking about extreme South America, an area called Patagonia, Tierra del Fuego, which is the southern tip of South America from Magellan being there in 1520, um, uh, all the way through Charles Darwin in the 1800s went there. Every single group that went down there said these people are exceedingly large and they started out being called giants 10 feet tall and then 9 feet tall. By the time that Sir Francis Drake got there, he said, oh, these, these 10 footers were exaggerated. And he said, the tallest I found was 8 feet high. <laughs> <laughs> but he called all the early ones exaggerations. Darwin, when he got there in the mid 1800s, saw an extermination going on, and he wrote about it in detail. They were getting rid of virtually all of the indigenous tribes down there for two reasons. One is there was gold, and the explore I'll call them explorers, but they really weren't explorers. They wanted to get rid of the indigenous people so they could mine for gold. And it was also great sheep herding country, so they wanted to get the indigenous people out. So they were literally doing a war of, of extermination. And by by the mid-1800s, there was only one female left of the tribe that had the largest ones of all. That was called the Ona, O-N-A. I've gone a long way with this. I've gone from North to South American giants, but there's so much evidence 
that these tall, exceedingly tall people existed. It's just overwhelming, yet skeptics just keep saying, no, no, no. And I'm using the term giant, not in the sense of someone that's 20 and 30 feet tall. If you've ever stood next to someone like Shaq O'Neal or someone like Wilt Chamberlain, I actually stood next to Wilt Chamberlain when I was 16 years old, and that man was a giant to me. He was seven foot two and seven four. Wilt was, and he was proportional in size. I was I was five feet nine, and he was a giant. Right. And that's the same way that the Spanish captains and the British sea captains explain them too. These people are giants, meaning they're several feet taller than us, and they're robust. They are proportional. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's the term. Now all the other stuff that we've ever read in in newspaper reports of finding 20 and 30 foot people at least in the americas we ran andrew and i ran down a lot of these reports and every single one of them that we ran down turned out to be baseless the only ones that had credibility were always based on an archaeological excavation that was done by the smithsonian or others and those were usually reported correctly that is that the part that the skeletal remains was seven to eight feet in height Right on. That's a lot of great detail. I think the Carnegie Institution funded a couple of those excavations, too. And Yes, always- Carnegie did. In uh, 1958, Don Dragu dug into a mound along the Ohio River, and he found a 7-foot, 2-inch one in it. And he said it was one of the largest that he'd ever seen. Notice I said one of the largest that he had ever seen because they had encountered them before. And the archaeologists that were doing the work like in 1958 to 1970, they didn't have the same problem with saying that, oh, these people were seven feet tall. Today, archaeologists say that they all mismeasured. They didn't know about the process of spreading. One skeptic actually said, oh, they're all normal size, and what's happened is they got wet and they froze, and they got wet and they froze for thousands of years, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I actually asked the skeptic, I said, so that's why you think dinosaurs were as small as a dog, because over the millions of years their bones have been there, they've gotten wet and then frozen and gotten wet and frozen, and and they just got bigger and bigger, but they're actually tiny. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an absurd thing. Even in archaeology, what what the textbooks say is that if bones actually do get wet and then freeze and then thaw out and freeze again and do this over and over, they don't get bigger. They simply split. They totally split and they fracture, but they don't just get bigger. So it's an absurd explanation. These people did not mismeasure. They knew how to, what they were doing, but they weren't afraid to say it. And what's happened is there are people who take this, this idea of giants in the mounds, and the first thing that they'll quote after it is a passage from the Bible that says there were giants in the earth in those days. Right. So these skeptics, most of them are agnostics, and they believe that this whole idea of giants somehow supports creationism. And for their own reasons, they detest creationism. They detest anything in archaeology that even remotely supports anything in the Bible. I'm not saying whether I believe what's in the Bible or not, but I think it's absurd to to deny something because it goes against something that you just believe in. Mm -hmm. They believe in evolution. They do not believe in creation. I believe in evolution, too, but I'm also somewhat of a creationist in a a different way. I think both take place. Yeah, I think the history is quite, it's quite a mixed bag. I don't think you can put the entire history into, into one box. I agree with that completely. But anything to them that even remotely supports the idea in the Bible that there were giants, they do whatever they can to say this is not true. They ridicule it. They will make up arguments against it that are completely untrue. And then we've even, we've been called, Andrew and I have been called racist by a mainstream archaeologist recently who reviewed the book. And in it, he said, uh, his very first sentence said that we're racist because we assert that the Salutrians came over from Europe and they taught the poor, stupid, indigenous people here 
how to build maps. And that is not in our book at all. <laughs> not at all. They were already building mounds. There were mounds in South America. The first mounds were found in South America. And the natives built the mounds. And I actually pointed that out to the guy and he said, yeah, well, your, your genetics is all wrong in this. And, but he only says that. And the truth is he doesn't understand the genetics, but we, that's why we're racist. We have said that there were multiple incursions into the Americas, perhaps as long ago as 300,000 years. There is good evidence in South America of that. Something we haven't talked, I haven't talked about here at all is the difference between what is in South American textbooks and their museums and what's in North America. Right. We tend to ignore what they say in South America, but they have archaeologists with PhDs from major universities who claim that South America was first, that South America had people there by 300,000 years ago and lots of incursions around 50,000 years ago. There's loads of sites that go to 50,000 years and that there was a southern route. That is a route from the South Pacific that hugged the coastline of Antarctica. And if you actually got into a raft, say, in either Australia or New Zealand, and you just floated. Now, it would take you about 100 days, but you, if you just floated, you'd eventually go along the coast of Antarctica and you would cut north and you'd go right up the coastline, the western coastline of South America, starting at Chile. And you, when you got to the middle of South America, you'd bend back out and eventually go over to Hawaii from there. So that is the southern route. There is a tribe that lives in the middle of the Amazon, the Brazilian Amazon, that genetically is identical to indigenous people in the South Pacific. They are, they know for certain that is who they are related to. There is no way that they could have gotten there around the, around the Bering Straits, which is where our mainstream archaeologists say they all came from. And that's why we're, they say we're racist. We don't say that all of them came across Beringia. All of them came from Asia at the same time. We say people came from Asia from using the southern route very early, a bunch of times. Then a whole bunch of people came over across Beringia at the end of the last ice age, around around 15,000 years ago. And then the final incursion was a group of these Salutrians, a small group of them who eventually became the Clovis culture, coming from Europe. But ultimately, we know the Salutrians were simply a mass of moving people migrating out of Asia. They were Asians also, and that's stated very clearly in the book. So mm -hmm. all of the peoples who came to the Americas, as far as we're concerned, as far as the, the evidence that we've looked at is, is concerned, they all came from Asia. It's just from different time frames, and they took different routes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense. And of course, it's a complicated history, but that's another great summary. And what about the mounds themselves? These are more than just hills, right? They're pretty sophisticated ritual structures. I believe you've called them magic machines for the death journey and a spiritual engine of sorts. And maybe we should talk about the context of the path of souls because that ties in as well. Sure. Uh, well, let's first let's get straight when mound building started. In North America, mound building started around 4,500 BC or about 6,500 years ago. So we're talking about 6,500 years ago in North America, mounds started being constructed. Initially, the first ones were, they're usually called midden mounds, and a midden mound is a buildup of refuse and material. There are some earthworks that they made, which let me explain that. It could be a round oval-shaped formation, several hundred feet in diameter, where the interior is flat and low, but then there is an earthen wall built around it. There are loads of those, by the way, and those can go back to three to 4,000 years ago. So those were the first kinds. And then they started building these large Adena mounds, which were these giant burial mounds that were like cones. And often there was an earthwork built around them with a moat. There are some in England and Europe that are identical to these. Over there, they'll call them a barrow. 
where they'll or a hinge. A hinge is a, a, an earthwork that has a moat inside, and then it has a flat interior. And often they're just giant circles. For example, in this area, this, the area that I mentioned around the Kanoa River Valley, there are some very large Adena mounds that are 50, 60, 70 feet tall. They have diameters of like 350 feet, and around them is a moat, and then outside of the moat, there was an earthwork that was 8 to 10 feet tall. Now, there were many of those in Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky. There's still quite a few of them in existence. That then evolved into what's called the Hopewell. The Hope, and all these names come out of places where they were first identified. The Hopewell started around 500 BC, and they made geometric earthworks. The most extensive and the most incredible earthworks in the world are in Newark, Ohio. They, it's recently just come under a great deal of controversy because there's a battle between the Ohio Historical Society and the club that operates the largest one of these earthworks still that remains today. And it's called Mound Builders Golf Course. And what it is, it was this Hopewell Earthworks that long, long ago was a contract was given out to a golf club that they would preserve these earthworks. They could use it as a golf course if they would maintain the integrity of it and keep them in pristine condition. And they have done that. And what it is, it's called the circle and octagon. The circle is a wall of earth, a continuous circular wall of earth that encloses 20 acres, and it's a perfect circle, totally flat in the center of these 20 acres, and then it connects to an, to an octagon that encloses 50 acres. The octagon is formed by eight straight lines of earth that are about 10 to 15 feet high, so those walls of earth are 10 to 15 feet high. On the inside of the octagon, where the eight points would come together of this earthen octagon, there is a truncated pyramid mound. Now, what that means is it's a pyramid, but with, it has a flat top. And when I say pyramid, it's earthen. It's made out of earth, even though there are some stone-covered mounds around the Americas. So that then has another circle outside of it, with a wall of earth around it, and it had a a straight line walkway that was had, that was enclosed with two parallel lines or walls of earth that ran about four miles. These walls of earth were about six feet high, and they were 160 feet apart. So you have this. Think of this. Think of an interstate highway running just three or four miles. And on both sides of the highway, it's all earth in the in the center where the highway is. But on both sides of it, somebody has built a wall of earth that encloses you. So that then goes to a what is called the Great Circle. This still exists in Newark, Ohio. It encloses 50 acres. The outer wall of this thing is about 12 feet high. On the inside of it is a moat that is seven feet deep. And in the center of this 50-acre complex is a earthen effigy mound that is shaped into a eagle that is lying on its back with its wings out. That exists there. Now, I, now almost all of the rest of this incredible complex of earthworks has been destroyed. There are some portions of it. It's almost impossible to describe it. The reason I took so much time explaining what the this walkway would be, 160 feet wide with the walls of earth on both sides and closing it, there was another walkway that was made identically. And it had the two walls of earth on both sides, about 160 feet apart. They were three to five feet high on both sides and perfectly flat on the inside of the walkway, and it ran 56 miles south to Chillicothe, Ohio, where it terminated at an almost identical circle and octagon formation. 
and there are several others of these in that exact vicinity in Chillicothe. That is the most extensive earthworks in the world. There is nothing that compares to it, yet it's just almost unknown among Americans. We just don't know about it. Um, but that's just one. There are loads of these. Portsmouth, Ohio had probably the most incredible of all, and a lot of that's been destroyed, but a lot of it still remains. So there were hundreds of these Hopewell-type formations. The Hopewell then evolved into what is known as the Mississippians, and the Mississippians built gigantic mounds, the Cahokia Mound, for example. The, The mounds there, there's 120 mounds at the Cahokia, Illinois site. Now, Cahokia is about 10 miles to the east of St. Louis. When you get on top of the tallest mound, you can see downtown St. Louis and you can see the Mississippi River. But these 120 mounds formed a massive city that at least 25,000 people lived at. That's kind of the lowest number anybody gives. Some archaeologists believe 50,000 people lived there. It ended around the year 1200, A.D. 1200, so it would be about 800 years ago. The Cahokia's tallest mound was called Monk's Mound. It sits atop a, it sits atop 13 acres. That's how big it is, this one mound. And that is larger than the Great Pyramid at Giza. It is the height of a 10-story building. It's 100 feet tall. It's massive. To tell you how big the top is, in 1987, 4,000 people gathered on the top of that mound at the same time. That's how big it is. Uh, And that still exists. And there's about 60 of the mounds that still exist in the park of Cahokia. And, of course, it's it's a World Heritage Site. Now, Cahokia was the largest of all these Mississippi complexes, but there are hundreds of these cities or towns that were part of this Mississippian culture. And a lot of them had 30, 40, 50 mounds one of the more impressive ones is in Moundville, Alabama, which is near the University of Alabama, near Tuscaloosa. And it was a massive complex. And, of course, that was the site where the Path of Souls ritual was really laid out. That's where we really discovered what the Path of Souls is about. And it sort of explained how and why these mound sites were built and arranged the way they were, because they're built and arranged to point to certain astronomical events, such as the solstices, the equinoxes, and the rise and setting of very specific constellations and stars. So that kind of leads into this whole path of souls concept. <laughs> yes. Hey, have you ever had start- anybody talk this much before? This path? <laughs> I have, I have. There's been times where I just introduced people and I uh, could have taking a nap if I wanted to. Um, But hey, I mean, I like to make the show about the guests. That's why you're here. It's why we do it. That is a great breakdown of the construction and the composition of a couple of the mound complexes. And that is important context for people to understand just how big and elaborate they really were. And then, yes, let's lead right on into the the purpose of some of them. This idea of magic machines for the death journey is, this Path of Souls stuff. I mean, this is their cosmology and their concept of the life-death cycle. I'm surprised how rich it is. Yes, it is. There were artifacts that had been recovered from mounds by mainstream archaeologists doing excavations. And some of these artifacts had just incredible symbols. Most people have seen a symbol of a palm of the hand and in the middle of it, you see what looks like an eye. That is the eye and hand symbol. Mm-hmm. That's been found in roughly 30 artifacts from the mound building era in the Americas. There's another symbol that a lot of people have seen that is carved onto all kinds of artifacts. It is a feathered serpent. It's like a rattlesnake that has feet and also has wings. And that's been found on quite a few. And of course, most people used, in the old days, they used to immediately say, ah, that's the feathered serpent from South America or Central America, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent in the sky. They said it was that, but it turns out it's not in North America. There are various other symbols that have been found, raptor birds like an eagle, but these are very ornate eagles and they're usually in, in, depicted in real specific forms. 
there's a couple of others. A skull, for example, a wide-eyed skull where the eyes are depicted as just round, big round eyes, empty, empty eyes, but it's a skull. There's another symbol where you have this skull with the round eyes, but there's like, looks like fire coming out of the mouth. That's another symbol. It was these symbols that actually led a whole lot of archaeologists into the field. And up until around the year 2005 or so, you go into mound museums, which a lot of the the biggest mound complexes have museums there. So they have depicted some of the symbols, and a lot of them have the artifacts with the symbols that were found on them. You can see the actual artifacts, and they're just fascinating. If you read what the archaeologists wrote back in 2000, and you can read interviews with them, even my own books, I always focused in on the symbols. But a lot of them would say, a lot of the the archaeologists would say, we'll probably never, ever know what these symbols were or what they really mean. But darn, they're interesting. And that's why they got into the field. But here's the thing. We do know now what they mean. And paradoxically, it was the passing of those laws in 1989 and 90 which led to the discovery of what all these symbols mean. Because up until 1989 and 90, American archaeologists focused almost all their work on excavations and the cataloging of artifacts and trying to identify cultures based upon the pottery they would dig out. You know, they'd look at radiocarbon dates and that kind of stuff, doing what they called was science. But they ignored the mythology that the Native Americans themselves had. And it wasn't scientific then for them to look at a symbol and speculate upon what it might mean. And, of course, they really, at that time, had up until 90, 1990, I hate to say it, but they really were very degrading to Native Americans. And I experienced that that myself. I wrote about that a little bit in the book People of the Web back in 1990, which tells the story about that shaman who stayed with us for 30 days. So what what happened in the mid-1990s for their own reasons, meaning apparently they had to do something to justify their existence, a group of archaeologists and ethnographers and anthropologists came together every year at Texas State University, and they had an ongoing conference to try and unravel what they called the symbology of the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. The Southeastern Ceremonial Complex is represented by those symbols on the artifacts that I just described, meaning the, the skull. I missed talking about a bone. You'd see an ulna on a lot of artifacts, just the bone, the ulna. You'd see the skull with the, the it looked like a speech box coming out of the mouth. You'd also see the raptor bird, the eye and hand, and of course the, the feathered serpent, and there were a few others. But they, decided we need to figure out what these things mean. So what they did was the ethnographers started pulling out some of the literally hundreds of old reports and Smithsonian books and books published by the U.S. government by Schoolcraft, Henry Schoolcraft and many others, where they actually talked about all those beliefs. And they began analyzing all of these books, which were in libraries. I used to look at them. I still do. They were not digitized. That is, you couldn't get on the Internet and look at them. And you actually had to go to the library, and you had to either check them out, or you had to sit there, and you had to go through them. And there are literally hundreds of these. But what the ethnographers did back in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, all to the early 1900s, they literally went into the tribes and they talked to the shaman and the medicine men and the tribal elders and leaders, and they started writing down their stories, and they started writing down as much as they could about their rituals, and there were actually rituals that were seen at the time and written down, 
But as even a Native American said, all those books were languishing away in libraries unread because archaeologists didn't want to read all that because it was nonsense and because it wasn't on the Internet. I know lots of researchers that haven't set foot in a library. Everything they do is online. So this group of, of archaeologists and ethnographers got together, and around the year 2004 or so, they started issuing their reports. And by roughly 2010, they had figured it all out. And when I, when I became aware of this, I immediately let Andrew Collins know, because what they found was that the constellation of Cygnus and the constellation of Orion were central to this whole belief system about the path of souls or the death journey or where our souls come from because this is a two-way journey. Souls come to the earth from the stars in their belief system and souls return to the stars after death and souls that are going to reincarnate go back and forth. All this is incorporated into their belief system. So Andrew and I wrote a book back in 2014. He wrote an extensive introduction and an afterward where he talked about the Denise events. That's where it started. And our new book is really a follow-up to all that. And he talked about the Denise events being larger and more robust than others. And he said they were probably the Adena giants. So that's how we got into all this. But let me explain the whole path of souls concept. and then how we decided to validate this in a, in a very scientific way. So the idea is this. They believed that we had two souls. One is called the life soul. The other is called the free soul. And when I say they, I'm talking about the mound builders, Native American mound builders. The life soul is the physical body. Remember, everything in the universe has spirit. It has an energy incorporated into it. But the the body, they knew the body came from the earth. They knew we were a function of of fluid and minerals, that we literally came from the earth. And they believed that after death, this physicality had to be returned to the earth. So that that is called the life soul. And the artifacts that depicted a wide-eyed skull, just a skull, with nothing in the eyes, and it looked literally lifeless. That is the life soul. And they know now those artifacts, almost all of which are drinking bowls, were used in rituals during a death journey ceremony. So that is a clue here. Then there is the free soul. The free soul is what most of us would describe as our our soul. It has our personality. It has, uh, it existed before we came into this body, and it's what exists when we leave. It has a place of origin, and it has a destination, and it lives on after the body dies. But it's what most of us identify as our personality. It accumulates all of our thoughts and all of our deeds and so on, and it has a certain moral aspect to it. We can be good and have been of service to our fellow man. Or maybe we were evil. So there is a judgment involved in this. So this free soul, they found out, is depicted on the artifacts that showed this skull, this wide-eyed skull that had the speech box or the fire coming out of the mouth. And that fire coming out of the mouth was the representation of the free soul leaving the body at death. And that's that. That again, all those were on drinking bowls of some kind. So these were used in a ritual where you would move from one type of container to another in this ritual. So that is the beginning of the concept. So where does the free soul go and when? Now, this has been figured out by archaeologists, not me. This is in their textbooks. And there's around uh, 30 textbooks that have this in it. I don't know how many articles, but I'll say hundreds. Of journal articles in it. So they know that they did this path of souls ritual where you release the free soul to the stars around the winter solstice. At the time of the mound builders, this era roughly 2,000 to 3,000, maybe 4,000 years ago, 
the Path of Souls ritual was done in the winter, around December 21st. But there's a window of time of several months when you can do this. And the free soul had to be released in the morning before sunrise. And it had to make a leap of faith toward the western horizon. And at that exact moment in time, Orion's belt could be seen on the western horizon. And it was seen sinking into the western horizon. So Orion's belt are those three really distinctive stars. but And it's actually a large constellation. Well, the Native American mound builders called it the hand constellation. They saw those three stars forming the belt as a wrist of a severed hand that was dangling down. The fingers were pointing down. In the palm of the hand, they saw a slit in the sky, which they called an ogi. That is spelled O-G-E-E, an ogi. The ogi is a little slit in the sky, and the leap of faith was the soul jumping across water, which that's an important component. I won't really go into depth on it. But the soul had to leap into that ogi right before it set into the horizon. And it's actually Orion's Nebula, which is also known as Messier 42. You can see it. If you go out and you look at the belt of Orion at night, you can see Messier 42. And when you see it on the eastern horizon, it's above the three stars. When you see it in the western horizon, it's on the bottom of the three stars. And it's fuzzy. It's kind of, It's got color to it, too. So that's what the eye and hand symbol meant. So that was the first part of this path of soul's journey. So the soul would leap to that, and then it it immediately went below the horizon, and the sun would rise. And that is what ended the, the initial part of the ceremony. So that night, the people, I still haven't gotten into explaining the scientific part of this, the people would have gathered, they would have seen this, the bodies would have been, the bodies of the deceased would have been put on a bonfire and cremated. And there would be a whole series of things done in this ceremony where people would sing and they would dance and they'd blow whistles. They would take certain substances. We know what some of those are. The, the, the planchettes or these round flat objects made out of stone with the eye and hand symbol carved on them. We know now those served as tables. I mean, that's known. It's it's amazing. You see these, they look almost like discs. They're about a foot and a half in diameter, perfect circle. They usually have really intricate edging around them. And it shows an eye and a hand. It shows the palm of the hand with the eye in it. And then sometimes there's a rattlesnake around it for a very specific reason. And the priest would take that out. When all this ceremony began on the night of the winter solstice, lay it out and put the various cups, these drinking cups out, and they each would be filled with different substances, which would be used in the ceremony. And the ceremony, the the participants in the ceremony would be the people who were alive, who were sending the souls of their loved ones to the stars. So that began the first step of the journey. Now, the next nighttime, as soon as the sun went down, you see Orion then on the eastern horizon. So you see the hand coming up on the eastern horizon. And right behind it is the Milky Way. You see this this path of the Milky Way. Now, the world was darker then. Most people listening to this cannot go outside and see any remnant of the Milky Way. Modern lighting has pretty much just made it all disappear in most places. Not everywhere, but most places. But what they believed then the next night, the soul would come out. It made the passage through the underworld, under the earth. And they knew that the the stars went under the earth and came up on the other side the next night. And then after that safe journey through the underworld, the soul would leap out and get on the Milky Way. And it would begin a journey to the north. And the whole idea of path of souls, the path is the Milky Way. And they believed that the souls were making a journey toward the north to go to a very specific destination. Now, along the way, they had all these little trials and tribulations and things they had to do to prove themselves on the journey. 
Some of them might slip and fall back to earth where they might be reincarnated or they might be cast into the underworld, which I haven't gotten into yet. The underworld was ruled by this feathered serpent. The feathered serpent was represented in the sky as the constellation of Scorpius. And Scorpius is like a huge scorpion. But they saw it as a feathered serpent. During the winter months, Scorpius is not seen in the southern sky. That's where it's normally seen, and it usually just hovers above the horizon. During the winter, it's not seen. And you can't take this path of soul's journey when Scorpius is in the sky because it will snatch the soul trying to make the leap. One of the things this explains is why... Native Americans would often store the bones of the deceased. They would bundle them up and store them. And then in the winter, they would they would take the bones of the deceased and do the ceremony that released the free soul to the sky. But that explains why they often did that. Now you might you you might wonder why these giant skeletons were sometimes found in these really rather exquisite tombs in the base of various mounds. Right. And it was because they wanted this leader or this shaman or member of the elite, whoever it was, to reincarnate exactly the same as the pharaohs in Egypt. It was the exact same idea. And they believed that there were two souls also, the Ba and the Ka is what they called them. It all just matches rather perfectly. So we're talking about a worldwide belief system here. Wow. Wow, man. You're blowing my mind. And we're at the end of the road, but hopefully we can do this again sometimes and just and just start right in the deep end of the pool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm I'm willing. Hey, it's been a pleasure. I can't believe that it's two hours, but it is. I'm looking at my little clock here too. Yes, yes. Luckily we're not on a strict time limit. Like I'm not fitting this into some uh, you know, radio show schedule, but obviously we're wrapping it up and this has been super interesting. You definitely cover the spread when it comes to the books you've written. Are there things that you're going to be putting out next that we should tell people about or ways to check up on you, websites, social media? A couple things. There is Andrew Collins has started a group on Facebook called Denise Ben Discussions. I'm on Facebook. you got to use my whole name to find me, Gregory L. Little. I post a lot of this on Facebook and any articles that I write, I'll put on Facebook. I use Twitter. I'm Dr. Greg Little 7 on Twitter. I use Twitter for my profession mainly and the books that I do professionally, which is my main, that's mainly what I do. Also, apmagazine.info. I generally put an article or two there every month. Beyond that, I had nine books come out this year, so I, I have several in the hopper. But I'm almost 70 years old, man. I'll be 70 in a couple months. Wow. So keep that in mind. I I don't know when I'll slow down. <laughs> this year, I have not slowed down. Nine books is the most I've ever put out in a given year. Now, I have co-authors on many of them, and that helps. Wow. But Andrew wrote roughly two-thirds of Denise of an Origins, and I wrote the rest of it. But the publisher gave us word totals. Andrew went over. I stayed right on it. So that explains it. <laughs> I do what I'm told. I listen to my superiors. <laughs> right on. Well, <laughs> man, I really did love the book and I loved everything you had to say today. You're an interesting cat, Dr. Little. Thanks for taking the time and for all the work you do. Have a good one. I appreciate it so much. And maybe we'll do it again. For sure. Oh, my, my, you beautiful people. How about that? So glad. So glad we could make this one happen. I'm sure it's going to be popular. This is one of those shows where I'm actually a little disappointed in the format where the second hour is reserved for premium people because, my God, did we get into some interesting places by bringing up his book, Grand Illusions. The spectral reality underlying sexual UFO abductions, crashed saucers, afterlife experiences, sacred ancient ritual sites, and other enigmas. (laughs) Woo! Mouthful, even for me. But it is the kind of nuanced examination of high strangeness that gets closer to the heart of things, again with the plasma. (laughs) It's all right up my alley. 
So, so amazing. And I hope I can get them back and we'll start there and talk about Edgar Casey also, who Mr. Little has spent a lot of time studying. But you have to tell him you liked this show and that you do want him to come back. Supply and demand, you know the drill. But what a guy. The amount of work he's done is very impressive, not just in subject areas that overlap with us, but even the vast amount of psychology content he's put out aimed at helping people with difficult aspects of life. It's a lot, and he's a humble guy. You gotta love that. And he added some important context around the mounds. He's got a great story of these dream experiences that compelled him to study the mounds and the mound makers. It's very close encounters or field of dreams. But the other mound books he has, the illustrated guides, I mean, this is a real contribution to the historical record. Same with the Path of Souls, just dissecting all that, learning it bringing it back. It's like when I get excited about a guest who's translated some obscure grimoire into English. Just, wow, you really did something. And I just hope over the course of this show, it's become obvious that Greg Little is a great example for Gregs everywhere, especially the less productive ones, and I salute him for it. And this was sort of a whirlwind for me, lots of content, and I can't remember if we relayed all the details about Juan Ortiz, but that is another wild and important story, that this 1528 gold expedition in Tampa Bay had failed, and then DeSoto and his men come through that area 11 years later and find this guy, Juan Ortiz, from the first expedition that survived and lived with the natives for those 11 years and learned their language and everything. What a life. There are no phones or telegrams to tell people that you survived, no contact of any kind, no way to get back home. And then 11 years, that's a long time. You'd really have to probably inform DeSoto and his men even that that first expedition happened. Just wild times, wild times. But also on the subject of giants, we've been talking about that theme a bit in the joint sessions, and I brought this up there, but we've heard guests talk about the Humboldt Museum in Nevada and how you can ask to see the bones of giants there. Well, I found out that apparently they have a sign up, and let me just read from it. First off, it has red haired giants with the big no like the no smoking symbol through it. And it says there are many myths surrounding the so-called red haired giants from the Lovelock caves, much of which you find on the internet is false. The Humboldt museum no longer has any human remains from the Humboldt sink area. For the record, the remains that were here years ago were not giant. One of the males may have been six feet tall, which was tall to them, but certainly not seven or eight feet in height. There are no archaeological facts supporting this myth. Please refer to blah, 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 Wikipedia, whitewashing bullshit. <laughs> I'm just messing around. But it is interesting that they do have this sign. Mm, you hate to see that, Cotton. And I guess we weren't the first to think about showing up there to ask about such things. And speaking of the joint session, I know we had some confusing messaging over this last joint session for October. I said I would do it on the 25th, released a show on the 25th saying that, and then I ended up canceling it a few hours beforehand. And it wasn't any super serious emergency thing, but because of the fires and the Santa Ana winds, a lot of people were without power. It took me just a lot longer to do anything. I was stuck in serious traffic when I canceled. I also saw that part of my zip code was getting power shut off, couldn't get a clear answer on exactly where the lines were drawn, and I knew some other people who were having a hard time dealing with all the inconveniences too. So it wasn't the biggest deal in the world, but it was a lot of logistical inconvenience, and I don't think I've canceled a single one since they started, but unfortunately I just couldn't make it happen. I would just move it back a week, but I'm going to be in Florida for the last week of October for my brother-in-law's wedding. Congrats to Dave and Katie. 
I haven't learned the dance routine for the time warp yet, but there's still time. And it's why the fifth show of October is coming out a little early too. I gotta get on a plane tomorrow, you know? Gotta work hard though, to play hard. So here we are. That said, if you want more THC, if you like the first free hour, if you enjoy how much I try to pack into a show and how little downtime we have compared to some of your other options, please think about signing up for THC+. Plus. You get an extra hour each episode, MP3s of the Higher Side cover songs, all that good stuff. And $8 is like a tip on dinner. Hopefully this show is worth that to you because I do try my best to make it as good as I'm able to make it. In today's Plus show, like I mentioned, it got really, really good if you ask me, and it was hard to even find a good place to split this thing because the breakdown of the Path of Souls cosmology took a while to explain and is also important in making this overall show sound complete. But in the second hour, the great Greg Little does walk us through a deeper look at the Path of Souls cosmology, we talk about why Mr. Little thinks control of the masses by the elite was a big aspect of mound builder culture. We get a breakdown of Greg's book, Grand Illusions, like I mentioned, and we hit that sweet spot lately, plasma-based intelligences that impede on our reality. Man, great month. Eileen Day McCusick, David Icke, Eric Dollard. I hope you agree. I don't love the fee, but commercial and sponsor-free is the way to be, if you ask me. And I guess that's it from San Diego's own stoner, Dr. Seuss. I'll see you on the other side of Jack Skeleton Day. Your move history, whitewashers, mound culture oppressors, and plasma beings permeating our reality. Your fucking move. Oh no, you see, the world is random, it's attached to puppet strings. Control over everything The nine to five is trying to steal ya Now don't that job seem silly Hello, can you hear me? Or should I play back recordings From some spy agency Wish we were younger and free I'll be thankful when it's all exposed The vast conspiracy There's such a difference Between us And the damn It's doubling your time.